There is a garden, there is a city, and there's a kingdom of God. And it is beautiful, and he is bringing it right now into our midst. Well, a very good morning to you, church. How are you this day? It's good to be with you at the first day of September. Happy Labor Day to you. Um, I want to say welcome to everyone who's joining us online. So glad to have you with us here this morning. And a shout out also to the Life Center. Uh, Welcome. So glad to have you. Today I'm bringing a message between two series. And so last week we finished up our series called Grow. And next week we begin a brand new series, as Pastor Brian mentioned, called Identity. Um, and we wanted to, uh, uh, we would love for you to be a part of that and to invite someone to come with you. Also, as I'm getting started here, let me invite you to be a part of Alpha, which starts this month. It starts on Monday, uh, September 23rd. It runs across nine Mondays. And, uh, and there's child care provided. We'd love for you to register for that. Um, if you've never been through Alpha, uh, it is a nine-week exploration into the basic uh, truths of Christianity where we, get, we gather together, share a nice meal, um, watch a video about the basics of Christianity, and have a discussion where every question uh, is, um, is, there's no judgment and it's safe for every question that you may have. Um, So we'd love for you to be a part of that. Please register today online. And also, I want to mention an evening with the artists, which is coming up on Friday, September 13th at 6.30 p.m. And the heart behind this is really to be able to put on a really quality event uh, for our community and to invite them in. And our prayer is that this would be a beautiful uh, experience and a great uh, first-time experience for someone outside of Living Word to come in and to see a little bit about uh, our heart here. And so it'll be an evening of of, uh, a lively discussion with Patrick Sells of Salvaging Creativity um, and Cliff Mayer of Rudy Art Glass uh, and talking about our brand new prayer wall and the, uh, the art installation that they built. And so we wanted to let you know that that also requires pre-registration. Uh, there will be uh, coffee and there will be desserts provided by Southside Cafe and featuring the music of Ten Strings. I want to speak to you today on the topic of forgiveness. And I am so thankful for the forgiveness that is mine through Jesus Christ. I know a God who has forgiven me. And I, I come often to my God and am reminded of his forgiveness and ask again for his forgiveness and to feel that afresh in my life. How many of you are thankful for forgiveness? Yeah? Well, as we begin, I want to look at a quote from a pretty gritty, violent, and yet critically acclaimed movie from 2014 called Calvary. And in this movie, Father James Lavelle, a minister, is speaking with his adult daughter, Fiona. And he says, I think there's too much talk about sins and not enough about virtues. And Fiona asks, what would be your number one virtue? And her father answers, I think forgiveness has been highly underrated. About three weeks ago, I put out on uh, Facebook a little uh, message. I said, hey, I am going to be speaking on the topic of forgiveness. I would love to get some input. And wow, got some really good substantive input. I want to read you just a handful of the uh, responses and comments. This one was from Emily. She said, I think for me, at least, there's probably a deep connection between my forgiveness of someone and my trust in God, because typically... Not forgiving someone ties into my need for control and my sense of identity. I think those aspects tie together for me somehow. I need to think about this more. And she put that little emoji like, you're you're thinking. This one was from Jean. She said, forgiveness opened the door to a deep and abiding relationship with Jesus. Forgiveness was freedom from anger and bitterness, thus allowing me to enjoy the grace that has been given to me through Jesus and extend that grace to others. I'm so thankful that God allowed me to truly understand that forgiveness is the key to moving forward with Christ and others. Thank you, Gene. That's basically my message. Thank you, Gene. That's great. That is, that's what I'm going to be telling you in a few minutes. This one uh, came in from Chris. He said, you know, I have wrestled with forgiveness 
It's easy to expect it from God, but difficult to give it to others and to yourself. It's a struggle sometimes. Well, I'd like to begin uh, in Scripture by looking at a passage in the book of Ephesians. And so Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander. Are we seeing any of this in our culture today? (laughs) Along with every form of malice. And instead, he says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. I think it's safe to say that our culture around us today is a culture that's absolutely filled with anger and relational division and bitterness. It seems like there's an angst almost behind every conversation lurking somewhere. If you were to Google the word outrage, you'd find that there's vegans outrage out there, there's dancers outrage, there's fishermen's outrage. There's even knitters outrage. (laughs) Knitters outrage. Knitters were not recognized by the Olympic Committee and they are outraged. (laughs) And listen, when knitters are outraged, they can weaponize those things, so we gotta be careful. There are certain things that if we're outraged about it, it, that's legitimate. But it seems like we are in a cultural moment where we are actually enjoying as a culture the outrage and it feels like it's even deeper than outrage. It seems that our culture is thriving in an area of resentment. It doesn't seem like people can disagree without resenting the other person's viewpoint and even saying it, I resent that. And not just resenting the other person's viewpoint but resenting the other person. Pastor Brian uh, mentioned the philosopher Nietzsche last Sunday. Well, Nietzsche had a concept. It sounds like resentment. It's called resentment, which sounds very similar, but it's taking it one step further where you take on the identity of a victim. Resentment is grounded in a narrative of injury or perceived injury. And what happens is this injury or this injustice or this perceived injury or this perceived injustice over time becomes central to a person or to a group's identity. And by the way, Christians can suffer from this. You just never, it's just funny though, you never saw Jesus walking around in the gospels with a victim mentality. Isn't that right? But something else can happen when we allow ourselves to feel this outrage and this resentment, we can be offended and we can take it in as a spirit of offense. And listen, as followers of Jesus, we are forbidden to let these offenses settle into our hearts. There's an interesting verse in Matthew chapter 24 where Jesus is actually talking about the last days and he refers to this. And how offense leads to betrayal, and betrayal leads to lawlessness. I was was thinking about uh, these concepts. I was searching for a good metaphor, and I came across one that I think will help us today. Uh, I like this as a metaphor. Has anybody ever heard of spite houses? Really interesting. If you've never, uh, I invite you to do a Google search about a spite house. So let me tell you a little bit about how spite houses came to be. Once there was a millionaire in Chicago uh, in the last century who had a little strip of land between two major developments. And the only problem is it was only two yards wide. Sort of an alleyway between two developments. So he went to one of his neighbors and he said, I want to increase your footprint. I'd like to sell my strip of land to you. And the neighbor said, look, you can't get anything for this piece of land. I'll give you a tenth of what you think it is worth. 
And so he was deeply defended. And he went to his other neighbor on the other side and he offered to sell it. And the other neighbor said, listen, I already heard what you offered the other neighbor. I'm not willing to pay that. And I know you're angry with him. So let me undercut that offer even further. And this man was so offended in his spirit that he did research, and I'm sure research was different uh, 100 years ago when, when this happened. He did research to find out what was legally buildable on that two-yard wide strip of land, and he went back and he built a house that was five feet wide and ran the entire length of the property between the buildings, and then he built it and he moved into it. The neighbors complained and tried to block construction, but it fit within all legal codes of the day, and there was nothing they could do. So he moved into the spite house, and he lived there till he died. <laughs> I'm not making this up. These are real. I want to show you some. I'm going to show you. This is a little uh, spite house in Seattle. This is in Seattle. This is not from 100 years ago. This is there. If you go to Seattle, you can, there's places on the internet where you can take tours and go around on a vacation visiting spite houses. <laughs> this is a little piece of land that got in contention, so this long, narrow house was built, and a guy moved into it. This next one's in Boston. <laughs> Same story. This next one's in Washington, D.C. See it there, tucked in? This is a spite house. The next one's in Alameda, California. I've read that sometimes these spite houses were built to block the sunlight and to block the view <laughs> of the person that they were feeling spite toward. This next one's in Alexandria, Virginia. Now here's what can happen. If we do not learn to forgive, our spirits and our lives can become a spite house, a narrow house that we live in till we die, that we hope will remind someone of how they've wronged us. This is not flourishing. Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief comes to destroy and kill. I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly, more and better life than you've ever dreamed of. If spite gets into our hearts, we can live in bitterness in a spite house of our own construction, designed to offend and remind people how they've wronged us and upset us. And brothers and sisters, this can block not only our, our relationships with others, of course, it can block our intimacy with God. Jesus says this in the Lord's Prayer where he says, where he says uh, that we will be forgiven as we forgive others. And it bears mentioning that not, not being willing to forgive also hinders our prayers, according to Scripture. Listen, maybe some of you in this room have big things in your heart and big things in your life that you want God to do, but it can't happen because you won't forgive. I was reading a really sad story. <clears throat> tragic story of a man named Ke uh, by the name of Kevin Tunnel. Kevin Tunnel. It's a tragic story. When Kevin was 17 years old back in the 90s, he was 17 years of age, and he went to a New Year's Eve party. He was drinking excessively. Again, he's 17 years of age. He's boasting to his friends that nothing's ever going to happen to me. Everybody pleaded with Kevin, Kevin, please don't drive but just outside of Washington, D.C., where they were having this party, he left and he drove under the influence. He goes driving and he ends up killing a young woman one mile from her home, Susan Herzog. So he goes to court. He gets a three-year probation sentence, one year of community service going to high schools, talking to them about his regret and remorse for driving under the influence. And the family sued him for $1.5 million in a civil suit. But they settled for $936 instead. Now that may sound like a good deal, perhaps, but here were the conditions of that settlement. Every Friday, the day that he killed their daughter, Kevin Tunnell was required to give a $1 check for 18 years 
the length of her life, written out to their daughter, Susan Herzog, to remind him of what he had taken from their family. This went on every week, week after week, for seven years, but then Kevin kept forgetting to send the check. And so the family took him to court, and in court, he said, it's not that I'm not willing to do this. And he actually brought two boxes of signed checks made out for the rest of the sentence, but they refused it, and they said, no, we want you to know every Friday what you've taken from our life. Now, the challenge to this, as we, we all recognize, was an unspeakable tragedy. The challenge is that these 936 $1 payments didn't undo the tragedy and didn't bring their daughter back. In the Christian community, we can't do this. We can never do this, but we can often, but, but sadly in the Christian community, we often do this to people. We say, you're gonna pay for what you've done to me for how you've wronged me. And every time I see you, in some way, you're gonna to have to make a payment to me, a small payment perhaps, which is going to last as long as I say, so that you can remember how you've wronged me. And this is living in a spite house, in our own hearts. Listen, church, God has something so much better for us. In the midst of a culture of outrage and resentment and offense and, and spite, God has forgiveness for us. Forgiveness is what Christians bring to the table. Forgiveness is our secret weapon. We have been forgiven by God through Jesus Christ. And we take this exact same forgiveness that's been given to us and we give that to others. And our posture has to be forgiveness. I started by reading you Ephesians chapter four and the last two verses of chapter four. Let me read you the first couple of verses of chapter five. Follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly beloved children and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Listen, you may be saying, you just don't know what I've been through. Pastor Aaron, you don't know the loss of trust that I've experienced. You don't know the wound that, I, that has been sustained within me, in my soul. You don't know the loss that I have experienced, the, the abuse that I have endured and have suffered. And I just want to say, it is true. People do really bad things to other people. But underneath it all, we are called to forgive. Now listen, I want to say this. Forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same thing. We are called to be agents of reconciliation in Scripture, but forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same. There can be forgiveness but there may not be reconciliation. You may have to put up boundaries. There may be legal consequences. Reconciliation would be a whole other sermon, and it's a sermon that will happen. But we are called to forgive. Lewis Smedes said something quite beautiful. He said, when you forgive someone, you are dancing to the rhythm of the divine heartbeat. God invented forgiveness as the only way to keep his romance with the human race alive. Listen, church, God is holy, God is just, and we're the ones who have broken everything, and he sends his son to give himself for us, to save us from our sin, and he gives us his righteousness as a free gift. He gives us forgiveness. And if the God of the universe can be sinned against and still descend to rescue us in love, who are we to not reach out in that same love to one who has offended us? Colossians chapter three tells us how. So how? 
How do we do this? How do we forgive? Listen to Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. You know, something about the Christian life that it's like, it's like getting dressed. We're told to put on some things. We're told to clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Verse 13, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. We have to clothe ourselves and put on love and forgiveness. We have to learn how to clothe ourselves as Christ followers. Listen, we assume that everybody knows how to dress. (laughs) Some people go their whole lives, their whole lives. In the church, we have to learn how to dress. Some Christians go their, go their whole lives without knowing how to put on what God has given us that represents what God has done for us to clothe ourselves with forgiveness. So very practically, how do we do this? Well, just a few things. First, we have to be really honest. How do you forgive? Well, first thing you do is you, you just get really honest. Recognize the ways you've actually been wronged. Don't gloss over it. Don't sweep it under the rug. Don't be petty, but be specific and be honest. Be really honest. But then don't go directly to speak with this person and talk with this person as a Christian. Instead, first remember what God has done for you. Remember what God has done for you. So first be really honest about what happened then remember what God has done for you. You don't, you don't position yourself as the victim, but instead as the offender before God who has been shown mercy. This changes our heart attitude. And then it may be helpful and healthy to sort of reflect back on some of your classic sins. A couple of your classic sins against others. Yeah, I do that. I've done that. I've done that. Yeah, I did that this morning it may be helpful and healthy to reflect back on some of the classic ways that you have gotten things wrong. Otherwise, we can get bitter and turn the other person into a caricature. You ever had a, ever had a caricature made of yourself? Maybe you were at the fair or Six Flags or Disney World or somewhere downtown Manhattan and somebody said, hey, let me, uh, let me make a painting or a picture of you and it was a caricature. And you said, I didn't know that my earlobes were that big. That's my personal thing. I didn't know that my nose was that big. It's not really a fair and accurate portrait, is it? So then finally we release. Release them. Forgiveness is not cheap, it's costly. And what a Christian does is a Christian says, I will bear the price. I'll pay the price. But we're not drawing on willpower here. We are drawing on this endless reservoir of the ocean of God's grace and mercy made available to us in Jesus Christ. Have you ever studied the Moravians? An amazing missionary people. An amazing people of of revival and renewal and prayer. They're the people who started Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. They they started Lidditz, Pennsylvania. Um, I've often been inspired by the Moravians. I love the Moravian Museum in Lidditz, worth checking out. The Moravians went to the ends of the earth to bring the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when they were doing missionary work among the First Nations people up in uh, what is now northern Canada, they, re- they, 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 they reached a roadblock in their missionary work because they couldn't come up with a word for forgiveness. And so 
they couldn't come up with a word for forgiveness in the language of the people they were trying to reach. And so they worked at it for years and they finally came up with a concept and they coined a word. And here it is. It's a powerful word. Say it over and over. Roughly, roughly translated. Not being able to think about it anymore. And we have to do this for each other. We have to do this for each other. Here's what forgiveness can do. It can give you freedom and release from your own spite house that you have built and moved into. If bitterness and offense traps you in a spite house, forgiveness opens a door to an incredible future. One of the most beautiful stories of forgiveness in the Bible is told at the end of the book of Genesis over several chapters, and it gives us the remarkable story of Joseph. And Joseph offers absolutely inspiring, astonishing forgiveness to his brothers who earlier in life sold him into slavery. Forgiveness opens a door to an incredible freedom. And theologians have always seen how Joseph was a type, they call it, of Jesus Christ, who one day on the cross would utter those most astonishing words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Have you ever realized that Jesus wasn't just referring to those people standing around the cross on that day? but he was also referring to you and to me, asking that we would be forgiven. One of my favorite authors on spirituality was Eugene Peterson, who died in October of last year. In his book, Tell It Slant, he has a little meditation on those words of Jesus from the cross as he reflects on those words of Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I want to invite the worship team to come out, and as they come out, I want to read this to you. Here's what Eugene Peterson says. We live in a world seething in sin and awash in violence. We daily read and see the news of it in the media, and we also come up against it, even though unreported in the police logs many times a day in our homes and workplaces and neighborhoods. What I am contending for as a consequence of praying Jesus' prayer from the cross is that forgiveness should become our first response to every person who demeans and hurts and takes our life. There certainly will be matters of justice for society to deal with along the way. And it may be important for us to participate in them. There are judges and prosecuting attorneys and police and juries. And there are many of us who pursue and uphold the cause of justice who are counted among them. But who else is there to say, Father, forgive them, but Christians who know how to pray that prayer with Jesus. However important justice is, and it is important, forgiveness is more important. The Christian at prayer, even as Jesus at prayer, is not, first of all, an impersonal agent of justice, but a personal conveyor of forgiveness and a witness to the resurrection. Such forgiveness is not soft sentimentality. It is hard-edged gospel. Such forgiveness is not a moral shrug of the shoulders. It is a white-hot flame of resurrection love forged in the furnace of the cross. Assuming that the criminal crucified next to Jesus was receiving a just death sentence. He said as much himself. The sentence was not revoked in Jesus' prayer. The criminal died for his crime, but forgiveness trumped justice. It always does. It always does. Ultimately, it's forgiveness that gives us the ability to influence the world around us. We can all be wounded, but forgiving enables that wound 
to become a scar. A scar that tells a story about a part of our lives that we thought would never heal. But forgiveness helps these wounds to become scars that tell stories of grace, stories of redemption, and stories of mercy. I wanna create a little space for reflection. I'm sure a lot of us, as I was speaking, had someone come to mind. I would say God brought someone to mind. And we are here to hear God's word and to receive it and to respond. And so let me invite you to get into a little bit of a posture of prayer right now. You may want to close your eyes and bow your head. You don't have to. But I'm going to go through a series of categories. And if God starts to bring someone to mind, this is your starting point of response. Is there a spouse you need to forgive? Is there an ex-spouse you need to forgive? Is there a parent or a step-parent or a grandparent? A broken relationship with a son or daughter? Is there a sibling you need to forgive or a family member, a business partner or a coworker, a trusted friend or a neighbor? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, may we confess our sin and then be the recipients of your forgiveness. And then may we give that same forgiveness to others. And Holy Spirit of God, no matter how hard it is, we state this morning on this first day of September that it is the desire of our hearts to forgive. Let us draw on your unlimited reservoir of grace to offer forgiveness. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that while we were yet sinners, you loved us and died for us. We thank you that you are a friend of sinners and that your word says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached, the forgiveness of sins to all nations. We thank you that this forgiveness has found us right here in York, Pennsylvania today. Open a door in our lives to your freedom so we can walk out into the future that you have for us that forgiveness makes possible. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, 